Okay? I'll be talking about first about handling problems from people and from situation. Now, this by itself can help Christians to handle our problems. But also in connection with counseling. When we counsel people, we come across people who are hurt by other people, who are influenced by other people. So this is very helpful in counseling because in counseling, not only do you have counseling skill, but you also be able to counsel people how to handle the problems. So today is about how not to be affected by people and situation. And if possible, we'll talk about emotions also. Now, um, when I counsel people, I notice that most people are affected by other people. Actually, I haven't seen one person who is not affected by people. That we are all affected to a certain degree. Some people are affected heavily. Some people are affected to a small extent. Uh, but most people are affected, uh, I would say, to an extent that it really affects their life. That um, the life is, uh, you know, without the negative influence from people, their life can be much more peaceful and joyful. And now, first I want to say, people are the source of blessings to us. We receive many blessings through people. When people help us from our parents, our friends, uh, our uh, Christian friends, all of this has given us help, including our co-workers uh, in our job. All this has given us help. But at the same time, one fact is all people hurt people to a certain degree, including myself, that I have hurt people in the past, and now I'm very careful um, how not to hurt other people, how not to make other people feel unhappy, feel pressure, uh, but this is something many people are not aware of, and many people don't know how to handle. Um, the first thing is, you know, if you think of yourself, for instance, uh, from your parents, your parents, you know, are the people, the, they are the ones who have helped you to raise you up, take care of you. They are the, actually the person that has blessed us most in this world other than the pastors, uh, spiritual leaders, that they have helped us so much. That's a fact. And we want to thank God for them, and we want to honor them. But at the same time, parents, without knowing it, could say uh, negative words, uh, like saying, oh, you are no good, you cannot do it, you are too dumb, you are too slow, things like that, without knowing it, that the parents Actually, many parents by them, themselves have been hurt by other people. So many parents themselves have been hurt, hurt by their parents and by the, uh, the family members and friends. And so many people just have a habit. When you do something not according to the, what they want, they will just say, you're foolish, you're too slow. I, uh, why can't you do what I want you to do? So without knowing it, people are doing that to us. And so many people would have hurt feelings, negative feelings toward themselves. They say, I'm no good, I'm useless, uh, people are not nice. And then some people also become negative toward the world. And negative toward people, when they see certain people, they say, oh, I don't like this kind of people. You know, in psychology, they notice that when people see another person, mostly in the first three seconds that we meet somebody, we kind of decide how we will relate to that person. In the three seconds we look at somebody, we say, well, this is a, it looks like a smart person. This person looks like a, a good looking person. And then we will have positive, uh, impression of that person. But if we look at this person, oh, he's poor and, you know, uh, ugly looking, old, sick, 
and it looks like he doesn't have much education. Very often people will say, I have no interest to have deep relationship with this person. I don't want to be a friend to this person. So very often, without knowing it, we have impression of people. Even in the congregation, we see some people that you will say, he's not my class, he's not my type. It's very hard to have relationship with the person. So that's one thing about people, it's very easy to have prejudice. Very easy to have negative feelings toward people. That's one thing. And this um, negative image of people affects our, the way we talk to them. Uh, for instance, if a prince, a king, a government leader comes to you, you will respect them. You would, you would honor them. You would say nice things. But if a poor man, ugly or dirty, uh, who hasn't taken care of himself, it's very easy for us to say, this person is a, a trouble, source of trouble. So this affects our image of people. And it affects us, it also affects the people around us. So that when they look at us, they might have you know, negative image and also, people have expectation. For instance, parents have expectation that children will be hardworking and do well in school, do well in, in a job and make money. And a husband will expect a wife to be nice, gentle. Mostly, men like women to be, you know, uh, gentle and uh, uh, very soft, very kind, and they don't like them to, to be nagging, to be talking too much. So they like girls because girls usually are playful. But when women get married, because women have a sense of responsibility, generally stronger than men. So they want to take care of the family, take care of the husband. And if the husband doesn't behave well, the, the wife would keep talking, keep talking. And that makes the man unhappy. So men like to have the expectation, want, they have the expectation that the women stay like girls. Gentle, nice, not nagging. And, and wives like husband to be caring for them. Uh, because when men chase after women, generally the men will be very nice and, and uh, you know, do all kinds of things to please the woman in order to gain her. But then after marriage, generally the men say, well, you're already mine, I'm your, yours. I, when I, if I go home every day, I'm already a nice husband. And so generally, many husbands, after they get married, they start not to pay so much attention to the woman. And they think the woman is too worthy, talk too much, too much requirement. So this kind of expectation make people uh, you know, when they're disappointed, and then they would dislike each other. So when I do couples counseling, or dating counseling, or premarital counseling, I find that many people begin to get fed up with the, well, a boyfriend, girlfriend, or spouse. They say, wow, he cannot do what I want to do. And, and then these negative feelings, you know, get higher and higher. And, and then what I notice in counseling, like a couple come together, generally when they talk about each other, they always have a lot of negative comments about the other person. <laughs> now, what I describe about people's image of other people, uh, the impression of other people and how they pay attention to certain people, and also expectation of people, and then when they find that the other person doesn't meet the requirement, then they would be unhappy and always be nagging or have negative image. Have you found it true for the people around you? Have you found it true? Have you found it true for yourself too? That you find that you have negative image of some people. And when you talk to some people, you are more respectful. When you talk to some people, for instance, some husband, as soon as the wife talk, he was, he's gonna be talk too much. Or the, or the wife hear the husband talk, uh, and then 
she would say, he doesn't want care about me. He just wants his, his ways. So we have all these things that affect us. Now, as a Christian, we want to be peaceful, joyful, and blessing other people, and helping other people. And when we have this kind of negative image of people or being affected by other people, it's very hard for us to be loving and kind and not to be affected by people. Isn't that true? And how we handle it will, you know, if we handle this in a negative way, then this person will be unhappy. People are not nice to me. The people in the world are not nice. Life is too difficult, right? That's what happened to most people. That experience with people a lot of times has brought negative feelings. So how do we handle this? The first thing is, do you want to live a peaceful, joyful Christian life? Now some people don't put this in high priority. Many people don't. They just say, I believe in Jesus, I go to church, I do some ministry, that's already very good. How can I not be affected by people like them? And I want to tell you, even people who serve God, when they two, see two persons come to them, one is a nice Christian, growing Christian, it's very easy for the leader to say, well, this is a nice Christian, and they feel happier. And then another Christian always Oh, always need help, always emotional, never serve God, always have problems. Already, it's easy for the person who serves God to say, this is a trouble, a person, a troubled person. It's, uh, it's not productive in the kingdom of God. It's very easy for us to have this, and it will affect us. And now, if we want to serve God in a way that pleases God, and also have joy and peace and love and freedom all the time. I want to say it's not easy. And many people don't have this image, don't have this idea. Yes, I want to be peaceful, loving, kind and free. No burdens. Most people don't have this idea. I want to be burden free. I want to be joyful. And. I want to share what happened to me, why I handle people's problems so carefully now. It started, uh, actually it started before I experienced the Holy Spirit, but after I experienced the Holy Spirit, I really pay attention to that. What happened was in 1998 when the evangelist lay hand on me, and I experienced great power like electricity enter me. At the same time I experienced great love, and I felt so loved, so comforted. I cried for a long time. I just felt being cared for by God. I just felt being loved by God. And I said, I never knew I can experience God's love like that. And then, you know, I went home and spent a lot of time praying. And when I prayed, I started to experience power go through me. I cried with Jesus, Lord Jesus. And then I felt power go through me. And later I started to experience joy. And every time I pray and cry to Jesus or think of Jesus, the joy would just flow out. So I really want that joy. When I went home that night, when I experienced the joy of the Lord, I want to keep the joy. So on the bus, I did this. Think of Jesus all the time. I could not laugh out loudly, so I did not do ha 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 ha. I just go. I kept the joy. I want to keep the joy because it's so precious. And I say, this is so nice because I've seen other people feel the joy of the Lord. And then I, when I went home, I kept praying to keep the joy of the Lord. And next morning, I keep the joy of the Lord. And every day, I kept the joy of the Lord. And one day, I call up someone and share with her my experience of the Holy Spirit. But this person was negative toward the work of the Holy Spirit. And she was angry, and she said negative words. And then when I hang up the phone, I found that when I prayed, I could not have the joy of the Lord. I found that my heart was heavy. And the Holy Spirit prompted me to call her and try to make peace. 
So I called her and I apologized for making her unhappy. I did not apologize for sharing. The sharing is not wrong. I apologized for making her unhappy, but she was still angry. And after I hang up the phone, I said, I already tried my best to handle it. Even though it's not my fault, I apologize for making her unhappy. So it's not my fault. And then I just let go and I relax. And then I praise the Lord and the joy came back. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The thought just came to my mind. Every time from now on, if anyone hurts you, anyone says anything negative to you, <coughs> handle it in the same way so that I can have joy all day long. So I made up my mind. From now on, anyone that says anything negative to me, anyone hurting me, if I have done anything wrong, I will apologize. I will ask the person to forgive me. And, uh, and if the person wants us to do some things that I think is reasonable, I would do it. And so I made up my mind. But if the person is unreasonable, I, then what, I would, what can I do? I can still say nice things to the person. And I have made up my mind. If the person is unreasonable, that is his problem. I do not want to be affected. I want to continue in the joy of the Lord. That encounter, that experience on that day reminded me. I want to keep the joy of the Lord every day. You know, every day I pray now. Every day I stay in the joy of the Lord. And I made up my mind, no one in the whole world and no situation at all will take away the joy. No one has the right to take away the joy. And this joy is very helpful. I pray for many people in different countries. I've seen a whole group of people filled with joy. I've seen people who are very sad filled with joy instantly. One person whose husband died, and she was unhappy every day, but I pray for her the first time. She was filled with the joy of the Lord. I've seen this so many times. I have prayed with a stranger instantly. She was filled with joy a number of times. And then the Holy Spirit stir up problems in the person, and then the person starts to cry. At first it's the joy of the Lord, and then later it's crying. And then, and then I help the person, and then later I counsel and pray for the person to clear up these problems. So I find that the power of the Holy Spirit is very helpful for me and for helping people. <laughs> and that is why I've chosen to live a life to be blessed by God all the time. To have the power of God to bless people and not to be affected by anyone. And I found that from that day on, my life was totally different. And God has given me teachings. Oh, yes. The teachings that I can stay joyful and not to be affected by people. And that is why, you know, I have a whole series of teachings that God has inspired me one after another kept teaching me different teachings and so now I learn different teachings I thank God for all that and one teaching very important is how not to be affected by people and it has kept me joyful but let me tell you it doesn't mean I have no problems I face problematic people actually God let me face problematic people right you know, actually all through my life I've faced problematic people, but I have learned not to be affected by people. <coughs> now let me ask you this question. Do you want to live a life of peace and joy? Or do you live a life ah, pressure, unhappy, frustrated, anger? What kind of life do you want to live? Yeah. So if you want to, then you want to take care of your problems intentionally it doesn't come naturally now some people say pray for me then I'll be joyful every day I tell them yes the prayer will help but I tell you you need counseling to help you handle your problems just pray alone it's not going to change your life because the Bible too it is not just prayer the Bible talks about teachings how to handle people's problems, how to handle our life 
so that we can be peaceful and joyful and full of the power of God. It's not just prayer. One time, you know, someone asked me, can you pray for me? And then I preach better. I said, it will help, but you need to learn too. Can you pray for me and I can play the piano like you? I said, well, you need to practice too. <laughs> just, the prayer is not going to make everything go straight. We need to learn it and need to apply it intentionally. So handling people's problems too, you need to learn it intentionally. Now what I want to say is, what I'm going to talk about here, not only you want to remember it, you also want to apply it every day. And also you'll be able to tell people what to do when you counsel people. So it's very important, no, we only have a few days time to go through this material. And so you need to really learn and pay attention and to apply it starting now. To apply it so that you can handle people's problem. Okay? Now we look at some Bible verses. And you can just write down. If you, you know, we don't have time to allow you to turn to it, everyone. So you just write down and then you can check it up uh, at home. This very important passage, Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? I'll read it again. This is Psalm 118, verse 6. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What this Bible verse says is that the Lord is for me, is with me, and He helps me. I will not be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of because God is almighty. God did all the power, has all the power, all the strength, all the wisdom to do everything. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What can they do to me? But many people think, these people can really hurt me. These people can really take away my joy. I want to tell you that. Whether they can take away your joy, it depends on how you look at them. I use this illustration. Uh, if this represents someone, can you see this in the video? Here. If this chair represents a person, now, as you know, you don't have to look, I mean, just see it, it's fine, you don't have to, uh, mainly it's looking at me. Okay, now, as you know, there are people who hurt people easily, right? There are people who get angry easily. Now, if this person is one person who always get angry, and hurt people, and even hit people, people like that, they will continue to hurt people, right? Do you know people like that? Always talking negatively, very violent. And now, this person, he continues to live like that. And God has a wonderful plan in my life and his life too, in his life too. God wants to bless him. But at this point, he hasn't taken the blessings of God. So at this point, he doesn't let God change him. So he continues to treat people in a rough way. Now, does it mean he's like that, therefore I cannot have joy? Does it mean he has problem, therefore I cannot have joy? No, I mean, that's his problem, right? That is his problem. Now, if he says, you fool, you're no good, does it mean that when he says you fool, I become a fool? When he says you fool, do I become a fool? No. No, what he says is just what he thinks, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all people are sinners, and some people are strong, I mean, are deeper into sin. So this person is deep in a sin, and so he's affected by his sins, and so his words are negative. So does it mean I should be hurt, and I will be, I'll cry, and I lose sleep? Does it mean that when he talks angry, angrily at me? doesn't mean that. That's his problem. So we'll ask ourselves. First, we want to discern people. When we relate to people, we can discern people. What kind of people they are. Now this is different from judgment. Judgment is saying, he's no good. I'm not going to help him. I, I, you know, I don't like this person. This is judgment. God doesn't want us to judge people. 
But we want to discern people. Like Paul in his uh, letters to the different places, he talked about people, you want to accept these people and to be careful about some people. If you notice that Paul said about certain people. So we want to discern these people. This person has the tendency to be angry and say angry words. So I know he has problem. Now, what can these people do to me? Can they take away the blessings of God? No. Now, they might be influential in some way. He might be your boss. Let me ask you this question. Can your boss take away your joy? No. Now, even your boss, some people are afraid of their bosses because they say, my boss can fire me and then I have no job. But let me ask you, who gives the authority that you have the job? It's God. Even though the boss might say something against you, but it doesn't mean I will lose the job because he's angry with me. If God wants to keep you there, he will keep you there. And if God wants to provide for you in some other way, he will provide for you some other way. The main thing is, no one can take away your peace and blessings or money, provision, or even you know, happiness in life, happiness in your marriage. Now, I hope you all have good spouses. I hope. But it's true that some people don't have good spouses. What can we do? Does it mean that when your spouse is not good, then your whole life will be miserable? Now, I, there are many Christians whose spouse, you know, are angry, unreasonable. Do you know of Christians having spouses like that? There are. So does it mean that this Christian will not be joyful for the whole lifetime? No. They can learn not to be affected by that, but it's very hard. It's very hard because you have to learn to say, that is his problem. What can they do to me? That is his problem. I don't have to be affected by them. So first is learn not to be affected by the words. Even when he talks negatively, that is his problem. I don't have to be affected by these words. Can you say it with me? If someone says something negative to me, if someone, says, something, say if someone says something negative to me, if someone says something negative to me, I don't have to be unhappy because of that. I don't have to be unhappy because of that. Even if my spouse is unreasonable, even if my spouse is unreasonable, I don't have to live a miserable life. Now, but it is hard. If your spouse is unreasonable, it's very hard. But how can you do it? The way to do it is to say, well. He has been hurt by other people. That's why he gets angry easily. Therefore, when he talks negatively, that is his problem. But I try to make him or her peaceful. I try to be nice to him or her. Uh, I try not to offend him or her. And, and I understand his situation and I have compassion on him and be nice to him. Now, this is easy to say, hard to do. I have faced problems like this many, many times. But I have learned when one person says something negative to me, in my heart, I'll be praying. God blesses this person. God blesses me. God loves me and God loves this person. I don't have to be affected. What he says doesn't have to stay in my heart. What he says it's not necessarily true. I don't have to take it seriously. Is it easy? It's not easy at all. But the key is, you want to discern what kind of people they are. And if that person is unreasonable, and, and I know that he would talk in, in an unreasonable way, then I would not learn not to be affected by them. At the same time, I have compassion on them and care about them and forgive them and love them. Now that is victory. Because the Bible doesn't say, you know, if someone is unpleasant, then you treat them with anger. The Bible doesn't say that. So we pay evil with goodness. That's what the Bible says. So we want to love them, 
but at the same time not to be affected by them. Believing that your life is precious, that you are very precious, your life is very precious. You know, after I experienced the Holy Spirit, I realized more, my life is precious. I can bless many people. Since I experienced the Holy Spirit, I start to bless people, many, many people, but still God want me to learn this lesson. God let me go through these difficulties for years that I have learned to handle my, handle my life and not to be affected by people. And let me quote you some examples. Now this verse is simple, but to apply it is not easy, but you can do it by the help of God. One time, one person who, is, who doesn't accept the work of the Holy Spirit, and he took another pastor, this pastor um, uh, accept the work of the Holy Spirit, but they are friends. So he asked this pastor together and he came to me because one time I said to one another pastor, I said, you know, I told him about my ministry. I said, my ministry is revival. I help people to be revived spiritually, help them and train them to serve God. And this person, when he heard that, he doesn't like it. He said, who do you think you are? I mean, that pastor has a big church, many people. Do you think you can do better than he? You think you can revive the people and he cannot do it? Why did you say you revive people's spiritual life? Why do you say you train people? I just listened. And when I heard him, I realized that he cannot accept the work of the Holy Spirit. He cannot accept that people can be reviving other people's spiritual life. That is his problem. And I just let him talk. In my heart, at first I had, you know, some, you know, uh, um, effect, being affected by him. But then I said, I don't have to be affected by him. So I, and then I prayed and said, I don't have to be affected by him. And then I stay peaceful. All the way I stay peaceful. Let him finish what he wants to say. And I realize this person is hard to argue with him. I don't want to argue. When, I fi when, when we finish, I forgot what I, what I said to him. But I did say something nice to him. You know, God bless you and thank you for telling me. And something like that. I don't know what I said exactly. I, don't, I forgot. But after I finish, I remember what the pastor said to me. He left and the pastor stayed with me. He said, Pastor Yu, I really admire you. When he was saying all these things, he was just sitting there, peaceful, calm, <laughs> no negative reaction, you didn't get angry, you didn't get frustrated, you didn't try to argue, you just let him talk. Why? Because I don't have to take his words seriously. That is his problem, right? <laughs> is it true? It is problem. And no one can take away our joy. No one can take away our peace. And it has happened to me many, many times. I pull you another example. I have all kinds of examples like this. For a few years, I served as a chaplain in a hospital. At the same time, I do ministry. I, do, I, I was cha chaplain so I can support my ministry in a church. And in a, in a hospital, it was a non-Christian hospital. And there were a few Christians that we know each other that, that these are Christians. And there was one Christian woman and uh, every morning, actually every morning when I see anyone in the hospital, I always call them by name and greet them. And I also greet this person, call her by name and then greet her. Every morning, good morning. And then this is what she did. Good morning. Very quick, good morning. <laughs> They look at me every day like that. And I feel, oh, why is it like this? I mean, we're Christians. Can we just give each other some good response? The next day, the same thing. Day after the next day, same thing. Every day, the same thing. And I realize I have to handle this. Actually, the first day, I want to handle this. And after a while, I notice that she's always like that. Then. When I see her in the distance, when I saw her in the distance, I already said to me, I have to prepare for this. She's going to respond like that. So I, before I saw her, I prayed, prepared myself, and then I went up to her and I said her name and then good morning. And then she did this again, good morning, very quickly. 
And I said, it's okay. It's, his, it's her problem. And I turned around and praised the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, the Lord is good. The Lord is wonderful. And I turned around and said, I can forget about her. That's how and how I handle different problems. And at the end of the few years that I work in the hospital, one, one person said to me, one nurse said to me, after all the, the few years, she said to me, Pastor Yip, every morning when you came, you greet us so politely, so nicely. I really like that. <laughs> she, was, she was one person who said this to me. It really gave me comfort. What I did to people is never in vain. Even, no matter how they respond to me, it's the problem. Let me ask you, when you face people like that every day, do you handle it right away, like that? Or do you stay unhappy? Stay unhappy for a whole day, half a day? Every time you see the person, you just feel unhappy? If you are like that, you will not have the freedom and joy. Hallelujah, praise so. <laughs> Some people wonder, why they can have the joy of the Lord? Because they cannot handle the problems. When they cannot, cannot handle the problems, then it's no way for them to enjoy the joy of the Lord every day. Now, but there are many reasons why people cannot take care of problems like that. There are many reasons. One reason, he would say, it's unfair, he treats me like that. How can I, you know, disregard what he said to me? How can I disregard his attitude? So people would say, that's unfair. He, every time he talks like that to me, it's unfair. <laughs> Did you ever say, it's unfair. I had to at least give him an angry look to let him know that I don't like that. But does it help? When you give him an angry look, does it solve the problem? Does it make you happier? It doesn't. But we just feel unfair. At least we have to do something. At least I have to turn my back toward him so that he knows I don't like him. But it's not going to help and it's not going to make us happy. But if we can say, Lord, I do it for you and I can handle it and I don't have to be affected by the person and I can say nice things to the person and even though when he says something negative I'm not going to take it seriously just let it disappear in the air he says you fool just let it disappear in the air and then choose to be joyful and that's why I remain joyful every day and I choose to be joyful intentionally what do I mean? Every day when I wake up, Hallelujah, the Lord loves me. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> Every day I wake up. I may not laugh out like that, but I, in my heart it's like this. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> so the more I see people, the more I like God. That's why, that's why I really like God. You notice from my teaching and from my prayer and worship, you notice that I always talk about how much I like God. Because I've seen people have so many problems, but I see <coughs> God is so good, so nice. So I always like God. I really like God. I really admire God. Even though we mistreated Him so many times. Let me ask you, how many times do you say to God, No, I don't want to do it. No, that's too much. How many times have we rejected God like that? Each Christian on the average, at least thousands of times that we disobey God or, or even millions of times but did God stop loving us? never so when I compare pe people to God I would say we mistreated God so many times and He, he continued to love us but we mistreat people one time He's angry for us for years <laughs> have you noticed that? and people some people will never forgive you for one time you said something wrong. And some people were so narrow-minded, they would take something very seriously. Little thing, take it very seriously. So I notice, one thing is, believe that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. People are just wicked. 
sinful, filthy, including ourselves. The point is how we handle our lives so that we live a holy, <coughs> cheerful, joyful life, loving life. It depends on the choice. Let me ask you, do you most, Christ most Christians live a joyful, peaceful, loving life? Do all Christians, do most Christians always treat people nicely? Always be kind to people? Always care about people? And when they see someone new to the church, they will walk up and say, How are you? I welcome you here. I care about you. Is there anything I can do for you? Anything I can pray for you? Are all Christians like that? No, I find that most Christians are not. Because most Christians follow their own desire. Most Christians follow their own natural tendency. After I experienced the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit taught me to follow God's will. Now, I have, before I have learned that, but I just never put it into practice. And I never thought seriously that I can remain joyful all the time. Let me ask you this question, what I just said. Quite simple, right? Sinful words don't have to take it seriously. If I use it in any way, garbage don't eat. Do you eat garbage? Can you distinguish, can you discern garbage from good food? Can you discern good food from rotten food? Do you eat rotten food? No. When you see garbage, when you see rotten food, you don't eat, right? When you hear negative words, can you discern that is, those are negative words? Can you discern? Yes, you can. But very often, we take it very seriously. And if I use an illustration, if someone pours some dung at you, feces, you know, at you, <coughs> do you want to welcome it? No. <laughs> you turn away. If it gets on your clothes, what do you do? Yeah, you take off the clothes and wash yourself, right? <laughs> do you go home and smell? This person is terrible. Why did he th uh, throw this at me? Oh, this smell bad. This smell bad. Do you go home and smell it every day? But people do that. What people say to them? They think about it many, many times for years. That person mistreated me for years. I hate the person. It's terrible. It's terrible. Has this happened to you? So many times we think about what people mis how people mistreated us. And we think about it and we lose the joy and we have negative feeling inside. And that is why people cannot have the joy of the Lord. So we need to choose joy and choose to follow God and choose not to be affected by people. At the same time, bless them and love them. Now this is a part many people don't like. These people mistreated me and I still treat them nicely and smile. That's unfair. No way. <laughs> but when we do that, then we lose the joy. When we mistreat people, if they mistreat us, we, we pay, them, pay them back. Pay evil with evil. Then we won't have the joy of the Lord. And also the Lord will not be pleased with us. And God taught me this teaching. Very simple. Garbage don't eat. Don't take it seriously. And you know the garbage? Don't want it. So just let it go. Now some people, they take care of problems like this. Now this represents a person. When someone says something negative, they are knocked down. And then they say, Lord, help me, help me, help me. Oh, oh, oh Lord Jesus, I need you. And slowly they get up again. Next time someone says something like you, oh, ah, so painful, oh Lord help me, oh Jesus please help me, and then gradually they get up. Now this is how people handle problems. Now, this way is very painful. What I do is different. I'll just say, it doesn't matter what he says to me. Say it. It doesn't matter what he says to me. I will not die. <laughs> say it. I will not die. <laughs> he cannot take away the blessings of God. Say it with me. He cannot take away the blessings of God from you. What he says is from Satan, from his sinful nature. I don't have to take it seriously. It's very simple teaching, right? But it's very practical. Can you apply it? Can you apply it to the people 
that are mistreating you now? Can you apply right now to the people who are mistreating you? Can you hand, can you say it? Doesn't matter. He cannot take away the blessings of God. That I have so many blessings in my whole lifetime. I have so many blessings. No one can take them away from me. Can do you believe that? First, do you believe that God really blesses people? And when you follow God, God has extra blessings for you. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all the sins will be added to you. So you believe that strongly. You say, doesn't matter. Even if people steal money from you. Some people say, I cannot forgive them. He, he cheated me and he took away my money. Ah, he took my money. I lose the money. Will God pay you back? God will pay you back. When you follow Him, He will pay you back. I have lost money, but God paid me back much more than what I lost. <laughs> God is a gracious God. When you follow God, He will give you enough so that you can bless people, so you can serve God. Hallelujah. Let me ask you, can you apply it in your life? And then can you repeat this teaching to tell people? Basically, it's very simple. All people are sinful. So they will say negative words. Let me tell you, also even Christian leaders, even pastors, sometimes will say something negative. But we want to be positive toward people. If someone, a Christian, says something negative to me one time, we won't say, this person doesn't have eternal life. We don't want to say that. Because this person might be affected by someone. Maybe his wife yells at him so he gets angry and he yells at you. Or maybe he hasn't learned how to talk gently. Even some ministers have not learned how to talk gently to people. How to handle negative situations. We don't have to take it seriously. But I know people, they say, I don't want to go to church again because the minister has hurt me. I don't want to, I don't want to forgive him anymore. So sometimes he goes like that. But let me ask you, do we have to be affected by them? No. And they are responsible for the life. And I want to say this, even when people have hurt us, don't classify them as hopeless. And still forgive them and bless them. And believe them. Even when people have some problems, he would have many strengths also. And if you see that this person is following God and loving God, even if he has some problems, don't keep remembering his problems. Forget about his problem. Do not keep thinking, that person stinks. Don't keep thinking about his problems. Can you do that? Is it, is it difficult or easy? Is it easy or difficult? It's easy as far as the theory, the teaching is easy. It's difficult because we feel it's unfair. We want to do something back. And we also like to think about the negative things and stay angry or talk to people about it. That many people like to talk to people, gossip, talk about all these things other people do. But all these are ungodly ways. Now to be a Christian, doesn't just mean believe in Jesus and go to church. To be a Christian means you let Jesus Christ be your king. That he guides you in every of your thought. That way you have more peace. You have more peace and you have less problems. And you have less problems with people. I, you know, I have faced many difficult people. And I've handled the difficulties. But when I handle them, I make it clear to them. I accept them. I care about them. I love them. I want to help them. I know their needs, I know their problems, but I'm not affected by them. Now this is victory. If I'm affected by them and say, this is class five Christians, this is class one Christian, this is class five, I don't want to handle this class five Christians, then we won't have the peace and joy of the Lord. So do you have any question about this? Is it, if you can think of one person, you say, no way can I forgive 
Now, let me use an example. For instance, if a husband uh, yell at the wife all the time, one, one, uh, one kind of husband. Another kind of husband uh, beat the wife. Another kind of husband take away all the money. So how do you handle these different kinds of situation? One husband is always saying negative words. For this situation, I would still try to counsel and keep them together. <coughs> and then talk to each other. And very often, um, husband and wife, you know, mostly it's women who ask for help, mostly, in marriage relationship, because women usually ask for help more. And then women will come to me and say, you know, my husband's like that. Generally, they say, my husband doesn't listen to me, my husband doesn't help me, and things like that. And then I counsel them. And I ask each other, you know, in a counseling, usually I would first ask them, do you want to make your marriage better? And do you have the hope, do you believe that your marriage will get better? And then if they say yes, if they say yes, and then I will say, okay, and, and I will go into counseling different things. But one thing I will ask them about, the difficulties yeah. and then how they handle it and then I noticed that this wife said my husband doesn't respond to me my husband doesn't help me that when I listen to the husband the husband said when my wife talks she has so much negative feelings always talk negative always worthy nagging nagging me all the time now it's both sides but usually the wife only see one side <laughs> and the husband only see one side the husband also did not see how he didn't care about the wife, you know. And so I asked him, do you want to make the marriage better? Do you want to talk positively? And I asked him, uh, if one person talk negatively to the person, I will ask the person, if the person say that to you and say, you are no use. For instance, I use an illustration. Husband and wife, and I, I suggest to them, husband, can you say nice thing to your, to your wife? And then the wife said, he won't do it. He won't do it. <laughs> what was his, her expression? His expression is, I don't believe her. I don't believe him. He won't do it. Without knowing it, the wife is showing, I don't believe him. He won't change. But I asked them, do you want to work on marriage? They said, yes. But are you willing to believe your husband and say positive words and, and, and believe that things can improve? But the moment I asked him to do something, the wife said, no, he won't do it. Or the husband would say, ah, he's always worthy. And I asked the husband, what does that make, how does it make your wife feel? And then he realized that would make my wife unhappy. So when I asked them, they realized that. And then I guide them how to speak positively. But most people don't like to do that. They just say, if he has done something wrong, I have to. Tell him it's wrong. I have to be angry. <laughs> Let me ask you. If, someone, if you did have done something wrong, if someone is angry with you, does it motivate you to change? It doesn't. We are all bad. It doesn't help. But when we see someone does something wrong, we have the natural tendency and we think it's right to yell at the person or be angry. But we don't realize that. We can ask the person, uh, what do you think about that? How can we do better next time? Asking questions is very important in, in helping situations, solving problems, not by saying, how come you did that? But by saying, uh, don't say it right away, but wait, and then say, what happened on the other day? Can we improve on that? What happened? Did I make you unhappy? How can we change the situation? That is good way of handling problem by asking questions without an intention to have hurt. Now some people would say something like this. Ah, he, he doesn't care about my feeling. Or when, even when they say, I ask the husband and wife, are you willing to do this? Are you willing to say nice thing? And then the one person will say, uh, he won't take it. He won't respond in a positive way. They always, people have the habit have you noticed that people have a habit of talking negatively instead of talking positively? And do not realize negative words hurt people and make people unwilling to change.
Now this is another issue we'll talk about later, how to change people. You have to guide people and be nice to them. And then gradually they can change, but that's not an easy process. What I'm talking about, some people say, this is daily life, this is not Christianity. But Christianity is about how you live Jesus in your daily life. How you can treat people nicely and handle our negative words. Let me ask you, do you talk positively all the time? When people mistreat you, do you always talk positively? If you, are love, if you love God, you want to talk positively to people. And that is how we can change. If we talk negatively with the habit of getting angry or gossip or, or say that the person cannot do it, then the situation will get worse and worse and our ministry will not be good. Now, some people do very well in the church, but at home they're not doing so well. Have you seen Christians like that? In the church they are nice to people, they can help people because people are nice to you, but at the home it's so hard to live with the spouse and the children, and then they get angry easily. That way, they're not living the Christian life everywhere. So, seek first the kingdom of God means that let the kingdom of God come into your heart and come into your family, and come into your church, and come to, to the place of work, and everywhere you go, the kingdom of God follows you ev everywhere. Is that beautiful? Yes. That's beautiful. Okay, let's look at some more Bible verses that help us. Genesis 50, 5 verse 20. You can just listen to me, you can write down. Joseph said to his brothers, You intended to harm me, but God intended for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So, Joseph said to his brothers, You intended to hurt me, but God intended for the good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Genesis 50, verse 20. So even when people intend to hurt you, God can turn it around to bless you. Do you believe that? God's plan is in heaven for you. Who can destroy the plan for you? Can your husband and wife and other people, can they destroy their plan for you? No. But one person can destroy the plan for you. Who is that? Yourself. It's yourself. Okay. Now, I forgot to go back to the husband. Three kinds of husband. One kind of husband always talk negatively. Then I would encourage them how to be nice to each other and it's best to have counseling. But sometimes one person is a non-Christian, then what I can do is to help the Christian not to take the words of the non-Christian seriously and be nice to him. If every day you are nice to him and don't get angry because of him, then he will gradually change. At least his anger will not be so strong. So the first kind. The second kind of people who beat up the wife, then how to handle? Sometimes, you know, some husband beat up the wife because they get drunk or you know, they do you know bad things and they come home and beat the wife that's one kind but there's another kind that they beat the wife the wife always say oh, you always are not nice to me you always did this and then the husband get angry and beat her now that is caused by the irritation of the wife now even though the husband is wrong but the wife keeps saying oh, you always do this you always do that you never do your work and the wife is, the husband is angry and then he's left her. Now this is another kind. This kind I will encourage the wife to, even though your husband is like this, I use an illustration, this represents the husband in a very low position and this represents what you like the husband to be. You want to change a husband, can the husband change in one day's time? No. no. But you are nice to him, gradually he won't be so angry. Gradually, he'll soften up. Gradually, he'll be more and more gentle. So, for people like that, I would not encourage them to be, to be separate. 
But if the husband always get drunk and come back and get a rod and hit the wife and hurt the wife, in that situation, I will encourage, I will, I will say if nothing can be done, then they should be separate because if not, the wife can be killed. I mean, that situation, if there can be life danger, then they should, should not be together. Another situation is that the husband take the money to gamble. Now, if this is, if the person can still be helped, then I still would encourage them to be together. But there are husbands who keep getting money from the home and then keep gambling and losing all the money. Then there's no way for anybody to live with the man. Because, I mean, you, you cannot live like that. All the money is stolen and then he, he gambles and loses all the money. Nobody can live with someone like that. So in a situation like that, if after counseling, nothing works, then I would still, I would accept uh, uh, separation. Although the Bible only talk about uh, adultery as the reason of uh, separation. But in that case when the husband would beat the wife to death or take away all the money all the time, then yeah, it's too difficult to live together. But in all situations, I try to help. Now, in a situation when a husband is so rough and hurt the wife, does it mean the wife doesn't have any joy anymore? It's hard. It's hard. But still, she can say, I'll find ways to handle it. And when the husband turns around, she can say, I can still have the joy of the Lord. I don't have to be affected by him. I know it's difficult. But once a person gets married, sometimes, you know, people get married before they became a Christian and then and didn't realize that husband has so many problems and then, then she married all the problems. Then it's hard for this person to have great joy. But he, she ins insists on loving the Lord, having joy of the Lord. He, she can still have the joy of the Lord. It's still possible. It, it is hard, but it's still possible. And, but as Christians, we should take our marriage very seriously. So I told a young man here who is not married yet, Tell them, your marriage is very precious. Don't take any woman. Don't take a beautiful woman. Don't think that beautiful woman or rich woman uh, are the best choice. No. It's God's choice. Now even God's choice might not be nice all the way. Actually, God's choice means, doesn't mean that person is perfect. God's choice means that's the right person for you. You both have to work on it. Both have to work on it. So that's about marriage counseling. And if we have time, we can talk about that. That's a big, big issue. Um, so what I'm saying is, no matter what the other person does to you, you can still have, choose to have joy and find ways to live together, find ways to, uh, to handle the problems. It's not easy. But if you have situation, you can tell me and I can respond to you. If you can think of situation, you think it's very difficult, I can, I can. I can respond to you. The best is with counseling. And I always think that there should be dating counseling, premarital counseling, and marriage counseling. Because people think when they are of age, they are 20 years old, then they are fit to get married. Or if they have a job, they have money, they are fit to marry, get married. That's not true. Because marriage takes a lot of maturity. An immature person get married, and he just demands, just want the other person to do things and complains and get angry. It's very hard to live with. So you don't just say, the man chase after the woman, usually the woman would, the man would be very nice. And if a woman wants that husband, a uh, man want the man to be a husband, the man, the woman would behave very nice way, very happy way. But when people get married, they change. Why? Because men usually think they don't have to pay so much attention to the wife. They think, when I chase after her, I will pay attention to her to get her. But when we're married, we see each other every day. Why do I have to, to you know, be nice to her and take her out for a date? So men don't have that concept. They think that we we'll get married and I come home every day, it's already, already very nice. I bring you money, it's already, already very nice. They don't realize they, uh, that the Bible says, love your wife as Jesus, as Christ loves the church. And 
gave his life for the church. So the husband is willing to give, give his life for the husband, for the wife. And for wives, why do they change? Why do women change when they get married? Because as a girl, there's not much burden. So they're very carefree, happy. But then women, God has given them a sense of responsibility. So women in a home will care about, is their food, is it clean? But you go to many single men's room, you know this single men's room usually is messy, right? <laughs> Hardly do you find a single men's room is tidy. But you will find some women's room are very tidy. And they get married and they want the room to be tidy. And they want things to be taken care of. So then if the husband doesn't respond, then she would, instead of saying once, she would say five times, ten times, keep saying, do this, clean up the house, or help me, or something like that. And, and then the wife, the husband doesn't like her anymore, because the husband likes a girl who doesn't want him to do things. But when people get married, there are uh, responsibilities, but people are not ready for that. So people have to understand this. Understand female and male, understand the responsibility in marriage, understand how to handle situation, how to handle emotions. All this need to be taught. So in the church there should be dating counseling, uh, uh, pre-marriage counseling, and, and uh, marital counseling, and also there should be teaching about relationship uh, all the way. Okay, so uh, now all this Actually, let me tell you, this teaching, usually I will teach for months <laughs> to train people. And now I have a few days, so it's very condensed. <laughs> it's very condensed. But, but basically the idea is, we all have the right to be joyful. No one has the right to take away our joy. And we can handle all problems, and we can learn not to be affected by people. And then Psalm 146, verse 3. Psalm 146, verse, verse 3. Do not put your trust in prince, princes, in human beings who cannot save. This verse talk about don't put your trust on people. Now, it doesn't mean you cannot trust your husband with $10. <laughs> you have to trust each other. But the degree of trust depends on the relationship. What it means is, you don't put your whole life trust on a person. Some people get married and they want the husband to fulfill all the dreams. Or want the wife to fulfill all the dreams. It won't happen. No one can fulfill your dreams. And a lot of mothers put the trust in their children. Children, they want the children to grow up to be working, having a good job, having income. Uh, you know, have a good marriage. They, if the hus if the children don't have good marriage and don't have a good job, then the then the mother would lose hope. Ah, very sad. And uh, many wives have to trust in the in a husband to provide for them and to you know and to help them in ways they need. But very often we find that they'll fail us. I don't mean we don't trust each other. We need to trust each other. But our trust mainly is in who? It's in God. But you say, I married the person. Isn't it right for the person to provide for me? It is right. But very often you don't find that kind of man. Very often you don't find that kind of woman. You find the woman is more and more worthy. And also because the husband doesn't know how to care for the wife and listen to the wife and because most men will say why is she so emotional why does she have so many feelings that i have to listen to oh i'm unhappy about this i'm happy about that because men usually say forget about it i just go out and take a walk i'll forget about it or have a sleep and take forget about it this is how men tend to problems when they're problem they take a sleep they take a walk and then they take a, you know, eat something and then they forget about it. But for women, they want to talk about it, talk about it. And then the man said, why do you have to keep talking about it? And <laughs> can't you forget it? But that's how women are. Women want to talk about it. So men have to learn to listen. If you don't want to listen, don't get married. <laughs> and how do you listen to her and 
respond to her, care about her, and face it together, and don't teach. But husband usually like to teach. You just neglect the person, you don't, you don't, do not be affected by the person, forget about him. But the woman just say, I cannot, I cannot. The woman like the husband to listen to her and care about her. So, so very often the wife find that the husband cannot fulfill her needs and then she will get frustrated and she will lose joy. So as wives, we know that we trust in God. We try to be nice to the husband uh, and not to be affected by him, but you will find that he won't fulfill all your dreams. So don't put a trust. So, so these are some teachings in the Bible that talk about people. Okay, and, um, and then Psalm 37, verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret. That means do not get unrest. Do not get angry. When people succeed in their ways, do not get angry with people. Do not ask why, why, why is the path so easy? Why is my life so difficult? Do not feel unhappy because of that. Genesis 39 verse 2 about jo Joseph. Joseph was sold by his brothers and then the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. So when we follow God, we'll prosper. Even though uh, he was sold by his brothers. So we know this one thing that people might mistreat us, but God will bless us if we follow Him and we don't get affected by people. Now, I want to stop here and ask you, can you apply this? Because it's very important. What I say to you is very, very important. Because if you don't learn how to handle this problem, you will have problem with your Emotions and feelings you will be affected by people. You agree that it's very easy to be affected by people? And if you don't learn to be not to be affected by emotional people, negative people, then you will not have a peaceful life. But do you think you can put this into practice? Let me tell you, in order to put this in practice, you have to be intentional. You have to be aware who around you are causing problems, who are negative people, then you have to be aware of them and have compassion on them because they have been hurt by people and understand them and bless them and pray for them and forgive them. That way it's the best for you, then you're free, then you're totally free. But if you don't learn to do that, you don't intentionally do that, then your life will be difficult. And also, Handle it in an easy, carefree, I mean, burden-free way. What I mean is, if someone says something negative to you, say, so what? Doesn't matter because Jesus loves me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Jesus always loves me even when people mistreat me. I am still loved by God. Hallelujah. God is a wonderful plan in my life. Now, I have continual strength from the Lord. So no matter how many times people say something negative to me, or some people mistreat me, I continue to be joyful. I insist on living in the joy of the Lord and have peace and love and freedom. And so I handle this freely. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So let me ask you, would it work for you? Would it work for you? Can you think of one person in your life now? When you go home, can you be nice to the person and have compassion for the person and help the person and be nice to him? No, it's not easy. It's not easy. When you think of sometimes, some people could betray you. Some people could say negative things about you behind your back. Can you still do the same thing? Now, this illustration. If this represents someone who betray you, who says negative things about you, you say this person deserves to be punished, but now you want to go and forgive and not to be affected by the person. 
And then you're also afraid that he might affect your reputation because he might have spread gossip about you and cause uh, affect you. This person, is it, is it right for this person to take away your joy? Does he have the right to take away your joy? No. So even if he betrays you, would God protect your reputation? You know, there are people who said negative things about me behind my back. It has happened. But I just believe. Now sometimes if they come to me, I will respond. But sometimes people talk about me without me knowing it. And I, I heard about it later. I heard about it later. But then I say, it doesn't matter. Because they will not destroy God's plan. And also, people have eyes. They will see what kind of people you are. They will see what kind of people you are. They will not just believe someone says, oh, he has this problem. People have eyes and they will see for themselves. So then, I choose not to be affected by them. In my training class in Hong Kong, I've heard four or five people told me, someone has said negative things about me. And I try to handle it, but the person denied it. And one day I said to that person, if you haven't said it, how come they could say specific things about me? And the person couldn't answer, but she was still negative toward me. I try to handle it, but I choose not to be affected. I choose to be nice to her. I choose not to be angry with her. I choose every time I say things nice to her, even though I heard that from a few people, because I believe that my reputation is preserved by God, not by people. And that's trusting God. That God's plan will not be destroyed by anybody except by me. If I sin or if I am affected by people, then I, then, then I can destroy.